Last year, I purchased this Tangerine iBook G3 clamshell from eBay and I've always been very happy with it, except for one thing, the battery, which is completely dead, but not unexpected considering that this year marks the 26th anniversary of its introduction. It works fine on mains power with the yo-yo adapter, but sometimes it might be nice not to be tethered to a power outlet. However, I recently stumbled upon a video by the legendary Aussie phone fixer-upper Hugh Jeffries, where he did what I'm hoping to attempt to do in this video, reselling the battery. It looks fairly simple, even enough for me, so I figured I'd give it a try. Right after this message from PCBWay. If you want to make your own PCB designs or build an open source project, PCBWay has the tools to make them a reality. Not only do they have PCB fabrication, but they also offer services such as 3D printing in various materials, all the way to injection molding, CNC machining and sheet metal fabrication. They really do it all. They offer a fantastic service for a reasonable price. Check out a link for their website in the description below. Traditionally, Macs have a PRAM battery, which is used to store certain system configurations like screen resolution, speaker volume, startup disk and the date and time. However, the iBook G3 doesn't have one and uses the main rechargeable battery. So when this dies, your Mac not only loses the ability to remember the time, but also may forget other system settings too. The workaround I've been using for the time is to use Apple's NTP server, which miraculously still works. However, I'd like to find a more permanent solution, as the iBook won't check for an update to the date and time on startup annoyingly. And I also stumbled across these battery cells whilst tidying up the shed that I purchased to fix my e-bike battery a number of years ago. See, there's a reason for hoarding, and it's for times like this. Now I don't profess to know much about what I'm doing, but I do know enough to know that cells really should be of the same voltage. So here I'm measuring them all out and sorting them into groups. The reason why I'm doing this is when I connect them later with nickel strips, there isn't a sudden rush of energy from one battery to another, whilst it tries to stabilise the voltage. Here I'm just using my multimeter across the positive and negative ends of the battery and recording the voltage. I've managed to find 6 cells that are 3.22 volts and 3 that measure 3.19. Now I only need 8 cells and I've got more than enough here for the job. But these aren't like the originals however, they have hard capacities, but otherwise they match the same dimensions. Be careful when buying replacement cells though, because some have a positive end which sticks out beyond the body, which makes them too long to fit in the case. The idea is to use this USB 18650 charger to bring these three batteries up from 3.19 volts to 2.22 by placing them in the charger for a few seconds, measuring the voltage and then putting them back in until they reach 3.22. It's a bit fiddly, but it was only 4 dollars from Amazon and that's been the only expense so far. Please also note that I'm far from a professional, so please don't use this video as a guide. It's purely for informational purposes only, and I'm not responsible for any issues that may occur. Hugh struggled to get inside the battery case, so I was prepared for a battle. Initially, I thought gently heating the battery up would help loosen any adhesive. It was a case of trying to get something between the plastics to pry it open, and I used some picks and bendy tools, but it turns out all I needed was some patience and fingernails. I eventually managed to get inside and it wasn't half as bad as I feared it would be. I'm not going to say it was easy, but that was the first hard bit out of the way with. There are plastic clips around the perimeter of the battery case, and the age-old retro affliction is found here too, and that's brittle plastics. Unfortunately, in trying to get inside, a lot of these clips broke, so we'll have to see how it goes back together again. It's not going to be on display, but I would like to be able to do as good of a job as I can. So here's what's inside. It's eight batteries wired in four lots of two and a little PCB battery management system. It's fairly basic, which is why I've decided to try and tackle it. But for a noob, it's still not for the faint of heart. What we'll need to do here is replicate this setup with the new cells, spot weld the nickel strips in place, and then solder it back to the connections to the BMS. All things being well, that's it. But no my luck, something's bound to go wrong. If you did want to try this yourself, you're looking at about £50 for just the batteries. You'll then need a spot welder and some nickel strips. You'll be all in at around £65.
I cut some pieces of nickel longer than I needed because I need to fashion a connection to the BMS. I did eight welds on each battery and then covered it with some insulation tape. This was by far the scariest and slowest part of the project. And then I broke it. There are two little PCBs inside the battery and I need to get my soldering iron between them. I gently pulled them apart but the flat flex ribbon cable snapped on one side. I figured that it would be unlikely that I'd be able to fix it but I decided to try it anyhow. I scraped back some of the plastic from the connector and applied some flux, tinned my soldering iron and managed to drag solder over them. It wasn't pretty and try as I might I couldn't get the two boards soldered together so I decided to give up. An hour or so later, once I'd calmed down and got over my frustration of doing something so foolish, I took a look on eBay, not expecting to find anything. But to my surprise, someone was selling an untested battery for £20, so I bought it. The layout and internals were vastly different, but much easier to connect up, so I got out my soldering iron again and gave it a try. I'm unfortunately not a battery manufacturing facility, so I couldn't get the case to go back together, no matter how hard I smushed. So, kept on tape to the rescue to fasten both sides of the case together. It's, it's fine, just don't look at it too hard. Initial results looked promising. The charging light went green, there were no bangs, pops and no appearance of the magic smoke. Then after macOS had booted, the light turned amber and it showed us charging. But is it fixed? No. I made a schoolboy error, which I guess if I knew what I was doing would have been obvious but the cells in the new battery I bought were backwards compared to the originals and I'd not noticed. So I'd spent all that time spot welding and soldering my replacements all wrong. I had to completely strip it down and disassemble it and start again. But you heard right, the light went amber. What was that all about? Well it did, for all about five minutes. Try as it might, it just wouldn't charge, and for good reasons as it turns out. So now the battery has been rebuilt once again, does it work? Well I'm pleased to report, yes, it bloody does, and I'm over the moon. So far I'm cautiously optimistic. I charged the machine up fully and took it off charge around 3pm. After around 2 hours, the screen dimmed and it said it was on reserve power, but that's lasted over another hour. Look, I'm never going to need to use this on battery power for that long, but it's nice to know I don't always chuff things up. Anyway, if you've made it this far, thanks ever so much for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.